put your hands up have been agreeing that you've, many of you have been in his presence for the past two or three days some throughout the day some of you have been drunk in the spirit throughout the day how to keep this how to remain in his presence and how to keep it active in your life John 14 verse 26 but the help of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do not let your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid John 16 verse 33 These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus says that when we are in him, we will be in his peace. We will have his peace with us when we are in him. He also said in the same breath, as he mentioned that the Holy Spirit would be sent to them, he says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. A little earlier in the chapter, he tells them, I will not leave you orphans. He had told them that he was going to leave, and that it was needful that he go, that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And they were concerned, and they didn't want him to go, obviously, because to whom else could they turn but to Jesus who had the words of life everlasting and so he tells them he's going to send them the Holy Spirit but the help of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you then he says peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you so Jesus' presence or physical presence is no longer going to be on earth. Physically, he's going to go to be with the Father. But he says to them that he's going to leave something of himself behind on earth with them. He says, I leave you my peace. In other words, the essence of Jesus' presence on earth today is his peace. And that's why when we are in Jesus, we are in peace. And that's why when we gather together and where two or three people are gathered in His name, one of the first manifestations we sense is this peace. Because in Jesus there is peace. And what He has left behind of Himself on earth is peace. He says, I leave you my peace. So if you can picture this visually, physically, Jesus is going, but he's left on earth something of himself behind for us. And he's left us his peace. I would like to say that the essence of Jesus' presence on earth is peace. Simply. Elijah found this out. Elijah thought that it was the wind. We mentioned this a few days ago. Elijah thought that God was in the wind, in the fire, and in the thunder, because he was used to seeing the powerful works of God. But then God had to teach him about himself, and this is what healed Elijah of his depression and his suicidal tendencies. Is that God showed him, no, I am not in the wind. If I pass by, I am big. And when I put my foot on the mountain, it trembles. But the fact that the mountain trembles doesn't mean that that is me. Very same thing. Just because you're trembling, it doesn't mean it's God. You see, you recognize Him by His peace. And so Elijah had to learn. And Elijah learned that, no, it was in the still, quiet voice, that stillness that came when God was there, 
That was the essence of his presence. Now, when that presence comes, it can cause a wind. It can cause people to shake. It can cause mountains to tremble. It can cause people to be healed. But these are results of when God passes by. For example, if I run my finger down Wayne's back like this, you might get goosebumps. But the goosebumps are not me. <laughs> this is me. And the very same thing with God. If God touches the mountain, the mountain trembles, but the trembling is not Him. Are you with me? This is very important to understand. We're going to really get into the application of God's presence and you'll be able to touch it and understand it clearly. Very few people touch this subject clearly. They say the presence of God and it's kind of vague and we're going to get into it very clearly tonight. It was very important for me when I became a Christian that I would be guided into the truth and the Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth and the truth the Bible says will set you free. Now, if I have just an emotional experience, that will not set me free. I want the real thing. Right? And so it was, I was very cautious when I first became a Christian. And I didn't join this church right away that I saw in Quebec because they were a little emotional and I was concerned about that. But eventually when I found, went back, I found that the below the emotions there was a peace. And it was the peace that had caused the emotions. And that's okay as long as the peace is there. If people are getting all emotional without it, eventually they can hurt themselves. <laughs> so peace is, a, I believe, at the foundation of God's presence at least, it's safe to believe that. You follow me? And I'll explain why as we go along. And that's what God taught Elijah. And this is what Jesus is saying. He says, in me you will have peace. So evidently, whenever he's somewhere, there is peace. Let's continue. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, you don't have to turn there. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We're going to turn now to Colossians 3, verse 15. We can turn there together. This is worth turning to. It's all worth turning to, but some is... You didn't hear that. <laughs> They'll edit this tape. Colossians 3 verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now I'm going to ask you one question. You've just read this verse, so don't answer this just, just, just because you've read this verse. Now, who is the only person who's allowed to rule in your hearts? Good. Somebody's alive. <laughs> Jesus is the only person who can rule in your hearts, isn't he? Isn't, he supposed to, isn't God supposed to rule in our hearts? Can I rule in your heart? No. No. The, governor, the, the Prime Minister rules over nation. the nation. Pastors and leadership teams can rule in a church. And hopefully they, they, they work with the people also. You know, they don't just... Hopefully they don't destroy the people. <laughs> and... But, the, but, the, but Jesus is the only one who can rule in your heart. So when I'm, when I'm in a church and I'm ministering, I'm here and, I, and, and 
Pastor Dave and has a team with Stuart and, 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 and Wayne and the whole team and and they, 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 they base, when I come here, my heart is to, they, they rule in this church, they make the decisions. I will submit what I have to them. If, the, if I'm in a church and a pastor comes and says, we'd rather you not do this, unless it's really significant, I would just basically say, yes, no problem. Because it doesn't affect Jesus ruling in my heart. They rule in the church, but Jesus still rules in my heart. Now, I have a lot, a lot of, you know, insight in the spiritual realm. And, and when I first joined um, the church in Stratford, Ontario, that was John Arnott's old church, at the time Jerry Steingart was the pastor there, he, he would come up to me and he would, you know, actually I would go up to him and I'd say, there's a cloud over this whole section of the church. And he didn't know me, so he'd say, thank you, Bob, that's good. <laughs> I said, okay, I went back and sat down. Because it's his problem. It's not mine. Like... He will be responsible before God. Not, and, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's, it's just it's His responsibility. All I do is I share it with Him. And so, but the Holy Spirit does, doesn't stop from ruling in my heart. And I share it with Him. And He does what He wants to do. And then I went back down and sat down. And you know what? God is bigger than all that. And you know what? The Lord said to me at one point. He said, Bob, because you don't think too highly of yourself. I will give you more. Because I can trust you with it because you're not going to go off the deep end. You're going to listen to others. You see, the danger is when we don't listen to anybody anymore. You know, there's security in the multitude of counselors. And there are things that I see that others don't see and there are things they see that I don't see. Right? And so... You know, we each got our spot and the pastor rules in the church. Now, they've given me the authority to come and preach. And for the moment, I'm leading this service with the Holy Spirit, obviously. That's obvious. But these are important things that I want to share with you. Now, there is abuse, obviously. And I'm not going there tonight. That's not the subject. But people can abuse of their authorities. And that's when people come and rule in your heart. See, the pastor ha cannot come and rule in your, in your heart, in your life. He can give suggestions and counsel you. And obviously, if they're good counsel and good suggestions, it's wise to, to, to probably heed to some of them, right? But he can't come and, and direct everything you do and, in, and, and in your heart, what you believe inside, right? He'll want to affect you and change you. But there's a balance there. There's a real balance. And this is why the only one that can rule in the heart is Jesus. And yet in the church, there needs some form of order. Otherwise, we'll have, I've seen places where ha there is no form of order. And that's more unsecuring. Right? Okay. Having said that, how does Jesus rule in your heart now? By His peace that rules in your heart. <laughs> because he's one and the same thing. The essence of Jesus' presence on earth is peace. There's no other place in Scripture that gives the authority to anything else to rule in your heart. Isn't that amazing? Peace is the only thing that's being given that authority. Wow. <laughs> A very powerful. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. The word rule is not actually rule in the Greek. It's a Greek word, brebeo, and don't ask me to spell it. I've got it in front of me, but I don't feel like spelling it. <laughs> okay? Okay, I'm going to try and be serious.
Rebeo means to referee. It's a, or arbitrate, or umpire is actually the. But it means to referee. It's a, it's a sports referee. Okay. It's a referee who, who's called to umpire in sports games. And what does a referee do? He's got a rule book, agreed? And he tries to follow the rules. He's the one that applies the rules. Now, if um, Canada plays hockey against the U.S. at the Olympics, you really need a referee, don't you, there? Right? Would you agree? Because the rules will not be applied the same way by both. Do you follow me? <laughs> because every belie everybody believes that the other ones broke the rules, right? <laughs> well, now this is interesting because talking about refereeing, we should read the context of this passage. Let's go back to verse 11. This is quite interesting. It says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all, therefore is elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God referee in your hearts. Doesn't that make more sense? <laughs> because there were complaints, differences, difficulties. There were, there were barbarians, slaves, free, Jews, Greeks. The Greeks had a, you know, they were philosophers. Jews were under the law. A lot of them, you know, came from... Came from they had the history of, of Judaism behind them. Uh, people that were slaves, you know, saw God as masters. The people that were free had a different understanding of God. And altogether, they would certainly disagree. <laughs> Just like if the Americans played the U.S., you need a referee. And so he says... If you have a complaint against each other, forgive each other and put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God referee in your hearts to which you're called in one body. Doesn't that make sense? Because the peace of God is a referee in the heart. And that's how Jesus rules in the heart, by refereeing in the heart. <laughs> that's quite a lot of authority to give to peace. But if you consider that Jesus' presence on earth is his peace, then that makes a lot of sense. Let's go to Philippians 4, verse 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're not going to read verse 8 right away. We'll come back to that later. So keep your finger there. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, or through Christ Jesus, or in Christ. Will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. I prefer that translation. Now, the word surpasses. is used in many different contexts. And so I'm going to give you some of the other contexts in which it's used in. It's used to mean more excellent than, better than, greater than, surpasses. It's also used to define rank of authority in the army. A general is superior to. So it also means superior to. So the word surpasses 
is used in all of those contexts, surpasses, superior, better than, more excellent than, superior to, as a captain, as a general is superior to a captain. And so the peace of God is superior, better than, more excellent than, surpasses all understanding. And the word understanding is minds. Your brain. <laughs> place where you think and analyze and get worried and anxious. So the peace of God is better than your mind to keep your heart and mind in Christ. And that goes, you see, what Paul is basically explaining is what Jesus was saying. In me you will have peace. In the world you will have trouble or tribulation. Because the peace of God keeps us in Christ but Paul also explains that the peace of God is superior to our understanding to keep us in Christ. It's better than our understanding to be able to keep us in Christ. And the word keep or guard was really the word for a prison guard. So the peace of God is like a guard to keep your heart and mind in Him. Does this make sense? That's why he is the referee. Because the referee, what does a referee do when you get out of bounds? He blows his whistle. When you kick somebody in the shins, he puts you in the penalty box. When you go offside, he blows his whistle, and you know. And if 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 the puck goes way down to the other ends, he call, it's an icing. You have to go back to the. But he keeps everybody in the game, inbounds, and he keeps the rules applied, and that's what the peace of God is there to do. <laughs> and so we should be letting him referee in our hearts. It's an order. Let the peace of God referee in your hearts. And there's nobody else that can referee in your heart. And what do leaders do? They referee in a country. They referee in the church. The policemen referee out on the streets. Judge referees in court, right? Peace of God referees in your heart. <laughs> That's a security for your heart. So if they take you off to prison, you go. But in your heart, you still believe in Jesus. <laughs> so, having said that, how do we apply this now? I'd like to read one other verse before we go on. It's a beautiful verse in Luke 1, 79. Luke 1, verse 79. Yes, there is a Luke 1, verse 79. Just trust me and go there. And the first part of this chapter is a prophecy concerning John the Baptist by his father. And the second, when, when it comes into the last passages, it's, it then switches concerning Jesus. Because John the Baptist was going to announce Jesus. And here it says that the morning star came to give light to those who sit in the darkness of the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way or the path of peace. He will guide our feet on the path of peace. Isn't that beautiful? So, how do we apply this now? There are two principles that we're going to read in verse 8 and verse 9 of Philippians. I told you to keep your finger there. If you didn't, it's too late. 
Verse 8, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard in me and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So there are two things that, we, that needs to be done to have the God of peace with us. We need to meditate on things that are good, true, good report, honorable, lovely. And we need to do good. And Paul had been an example to them and he said, whatever things you've seen in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. It basically means if you think what's good or true and you do what's good or true, the God of peace will be with you. Now, this is how the Holy Spirit convicts the world. Before you became a Christian, and this is whether you're a Muslim or any, wherever you are around the world, you, you're Buddhist, it doesn't really matter. If when you do something that's good, the peace of God referees. He doesn't live in the pe people's hearts if they're not Christians, but he gives them a tap on the back, he says, well done. If you do something that's wrong against the principles of love, if you hurt your neighbor, kill your neighbor, steal from your neighbor, sleep with your neighbor's wife, you will lose your peace. I remember before I was a Christian, I, um, I was going out with different girls and I had all kinds of girlfriends and you know when we're young men we have one goal. And I'm not very proud of it today, but that's what I had. And, um, and I was with this girl. And I was trying to get her to come to my apartment. You know, and we were sitting on the sidewalk meditating on this. <laughs> and she said to me, she said to me, listen, Bob. She said, my, um, my father wants me to come home at 10 o'clock tonight. And uh, I heard my, I, you know, I heard myself say something. I said to her, well, you know, I, if your father wants you to go home at 10, I think you should go home at 10 tonight. And I thought to myself, what are you doing? <laughs> this, is, this is not what you should be doing. <laughs> but you know, as soon as I said that, I had some peace in my heart. And I felt, I felt right about it. Because... You see, when your conscience is at, is at rest, then you get peace. Right? And so she, she went home, and I wondered about what that peace was. I thought, you know, what was, what's that? And I found that every, if I did, you know, what was wrong, I, I wouldn't have that peace. I'd be, I'd be troubled in my spirit. And I would try to submerge that. Right? You try to... Cover it up. And, and, and I would lose my peace. I'm not talking about mental confusion. That's another story. We'll get there. Okay? I'm just talking about spiritual trouble and peace. You can be confused mentally and still have peace. I've known somebody who's lost their husband being confused and yet God has given them peace through the situation. You follow me? Why is this happening? Yet there's peace. I mean, that's why the peace of God passes all understanding. Now, but this is how God basically convicts the world. And when people do what's right, they get a bit of peace. And what God is doing, He's trying to funnel them into the right direction. And so eventually when you hear the preaching of the gospel, your heart jumps 
and you get more peace. And as you go towards Jesus and then you give your life to Jesus, then the Prince of Peace comes and lives in your heart. And then you get really great peace, don't you? Normally, this is the normal way. I mean, and there are exceptions to this. So don't feel bad if you're an exception because the, the, you can never really generalize and just say everybody's been this route. So don't feel bad. But this is generally how it goes, okay? Um, so then, when you do what's right, you get peace. When you meet Jesus, you really get into the center of his peace. You follow me? <laughs> so now, the same thing is true of what you think. If you think things that are right, then you will get peace. If you think things that are wrong, you will get peace. You won't get peace. Now, talking about conviction, because we talked about that yesterday, I should really bring the application of yesterday's sermon. How, how do you apply this now? Because the accuser of the brethren accuses the brethren day and night before their God, whether they sin or whether they don't sin. If they sin, he has more reason to accuse them. But whether they sin or not, he wants to, he's going to find something to accuse you of. And there's always something that he can find because none of us are perfect. And I'm not supposed to listen to him. I'm supposed to listen to the Holy Spirit and his conviction. So, how do you recognize the difference between the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the accusation of the devil? How do you recognize the difference? Well, when the Holy Spirit's conviction comes, peace comes with Him. Do you follow me? Because wherever Jesus is, there's peace. So as soon as He's coming up to speak to you, there will be a sense of peace. Because if you're starting to listen to Him, imagine, you're, let's say you're in sin, and you're starting to listen to Him, you're going towards peace. Even before you make a decision, you're going towards the Prince of Peace. So as you listen to the Prince of Peace, peace will come. Doesn't mean you've repented or confessed yet. Even before, as you listen to the Holy Spirit, as He starts to talk to you, peace will come. Because you're starting to go in that direction. Let me give you an example. Um, we're looking for an object in the room. And I, I normally like to take a Bible, but it doesn't really matter. We're looking for an object in the room. Remember when you were a child and you were playing this game? And uh, you would come into the room. And as you were coming into the room, somebody would say, hotter, warm, warm, hot, hot, cold, cold. Hot, hot, boiling, right? Yeah. Remember that game? Yeah. Well, that's how the Holy Spirit does it. He directs our feet on the path of peace. And as we get closer, it gets hotter and hotter. So even as the Holy Spirit is coming to convict you and you listen to Him, it's, it's get, you're getting more peace as you're coming to Him and just opening your heart to Him. Now, if the accuser of the brethren comes and accuses you, it's the opposite. As you open your heart to Him, you're going further. Right? Jesus is here. The accuser is over there. If you turn around and start listening to Him, you're going to get troubled in your spirit. Because in Jesus, there's peace. In the world, there's trouble. Oh. Now, what happens? Let's, let's, let's do this visually. Let's put Jesus over here. He's not, no, I'm not going to, but let's pretend that he's there. And pretend the devil's here. Now, if I listen to the accusation of the devil, I'm going to get more and more troubled. And if I believe that it's God convicting me, and I repent, the more I repent, I'm going to get more and more troubled. 
The other thing that will happen is the more I repent to the accuser of the brethren, the less I get forgiven. There is no forg He cannot forgive you. Why? Because he doesn't have the power to forgive. He only has the power to accuse and to condemn. And so what happens to Christians is they repent to the accuser. The more they repent, the more they get troubled, the less they get forgiven. And so sometimes they can get into a cycle and they start thinking they, there's something else that's wrong. And, and they start getting into this cycle of repentance. And eventually if they continue down that path, they will end up in depression. Whether they sinned or not. You have no business with the devil. He's not your master. You don't have to repent to him. You repent to Jesus. Do you follow me? I got nothing to do with him. He's, I've been bought from the kingdom of darkness. I'm now in the kingdom of light. Jesus is my Lord. I have to repent to Jesus. And he's the good one to repent to because he's got the power to confess my sins to and turn to because he's got the power to forgive me and change me and cleanse me of all iniquities. So now the opposite is true. If I turn to the Holy Spirit conviction and I go towards Jesus, I get peace. And if, as he's speaking to me, and I'm listening, the peace will grow. And as I confess my sins, say, forgive me, Lord, I want to repent. What do I have to do? Peace will grow. And then he will give you something maybe to do this. On some occasions, he's told me, you need to go see your brother and say sorry for what you said. Or if I exaggerated or lied, I need to go correct it. Sometimes I've had to do, sometimes he said, no, don't do it because they won't grasp this. It won't help them. Sometimes he's told me just as an exercise, go and correct it. And when I have done what he said, then I get this perfect peace. Do you follow me? Whew. <laughs> because his peace passes our understanding to keep our hearts and minds in Christ. And if we follow His peace, He will guide our, our path, direct our feet on the path of peace. Now, the opposite is true. If the Holy Spirit is convicting me, now He's speaking to me. It's not the accuser. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Jesus is speaking to my heart. And He's saying, I need to talk to you about something. Come. Come. And I refuse it. I say no. And I turn away. I will lose my peace. And get troubled. And if I continue going into sin. And just ignoring him. I will get troubled and more troubled. Right? But. If the accuser of the brethren accuses me. and I ignore his accusation, and I walk away from it, I will keep my peace. You follow me? Whew. People need to learn this. This is why I'm walking in peace. This is how you keep your peace. I keep my feet on the path of peace because I listen to the, I listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction, not the devil's accusation. And that's why I change. Otherwise, you don't change. The truth will set you free, not the devil. <laughs> You're learning something here tonight? Good. <laughs> so what we've been doing this weekend is I've been, or this beginning of the week, you never know where I am anymore, but anyway. <laughs> These last few days, yes. <laughs> what? What we've been doing is we've been Preaching about Jesus so that you can grasp Him. And as you see Him as He is, His peace gets stronger. And that's why it's been remaining throughout the day. Because you've been seeing Him and holding on to that. And now 
It's been affecting your day, and the Holy Spirit has been remaining you on, on you all day. And I want to teach you how to practice this when I'm gone. <laughs> this is important. Okay, so that's how, that's how it works, basically. You with me? Okay. Now, <clears throat> very same thing when you're reading the Word of God. The devil likes to distort the truth. Did you know that? If you don't know that, you should read a few chapters about, you know, Matthew, in Matthew 4, how the devil used the truth as an accusation against Jesus. He was using Scripture. He was distorting Scripture. The Pharisees distorted Scripture to accuse the disciples. Very often it's used. And so, you'll be reading a portion of Scripture. God is love, agreed? And when you're in His peace and His presence, you, know, you, you meet His love. And so then you're reading the Bible, and you're reading that passage about Sodom and Gomorrah, and how a whole city is destroyed, turned to salt. And then you read about how a man touches the Ark of the Covenant, and dies, and you go, whew! Don't you go, where is God's love? Right? Many, many people have done, done, experienced that reading. Or they just accept, or they try to accept uh, that, that God is, well, He's love, but He likes to just kill zillions of people every now and then. <laughs> but you know, and so you, you say He's love, but He's not the love that I expected it to be. As soon as you say that to yourself, you lose your peace. You know why? You've got the wrong interpretation of Scripture. Because the peace of God is refereeing and saying, no, that's not true. I am love. It's just you don't have all the information right now. I don't always give all the information because I speak in parables so that people, some people won't understand. <laughs> there are mysteries in the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that? There are mysteries. And they're being revealed for our glory. But you see, when you read the Word of God and you come to a place where you, 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 you get troubled in your spirit and you say, oh no, God doesn't look like love anymore. You get the wrong interpretation. You lose your peace. You know at that moment that you've got the wrong interpretation. There's one thing that always stays true no matter what you read. God is love. And the, the, the love you believe in. Love thinks of you first. Love is not self-seeking. Did you know God is not self-seeking? He's love. Love is not self-seeking, is it? We're just going to do a, open a little parentheses here concerning God's love. Just a little parentheses. You see, you don't have all the information. If you had all the information, you'd know. But He doesn't give all the information. But God is not self-seeking. Everything He does, every decision He makes is for others. Did you know that? Not for himself. Some people don't believe that yet. He says, worship me, right? Is that self-seeking? It looks like it, doesn't it? It does look like it, doesn't it? What is the first commandment? Love God with all your heart, all your might, and all your strength. That sounds like it's self-seeking. Love me. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us, right? Okay. He's asking us to do what He's done to us first. Did you know that He exalts you first before you exalt Him? That's been very biblical. He exalted you before you ever exalted Him. He lifted you up before you ever lifted Him up. When He asks you to love Him and to worship Him, it's because He's already done it to you first. You see, that's the order in heaven. In heaven, everybody will be lifting each other up and loving each other. Nobody will be bringing each other down in your, their back. 
You see, and the love has been existent in the Trinity for eternity because the Holy Spirit has been lifting up the Son, the Son has been lifting up the Father, the Father has been lifting up the Holy Spirit. They have been lifting each other up. Oh boy. <laughs> And so when he asks us to worship him, he's saying, join in. We're doing the same thing for you. You seek the kingdom, the kingdom will seek you. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, the, and the devil, what he did is sort his own will. He said, I will be as God, and he lifted himself up. And that's self-seeking. The kingdom is not self-seeking. Kingdom is love. There will be three things that will remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these things is love. In heaven, it will be love. There will be no self-seeking. Well, I'll be looking after you. You'll be looking after me. God's looking after us. Yes, we'll have fun. But there will be no selfishness. Did you know selfishness is at the source of sin? Don't feel bad. We're all selfish. Selfishness is the opposite of love. So now we settle one thing. God is love. And all his decisions he makes are for you. Now there's another principle in the Bible is, you find this in Romans. Let's go there for the fun of it, shall we? Can we do this? We do a little detour. Can I do a little detour? Is this okay? Yeah. Some people need to hear this. They don't know about this. Yeah, keep your fingers in Philippians. Let's go Romans 8, verse 28. I don't know if you remember the other night I said to you that um, the mysteries have been prepared for the, those that love God. I don't know if you remember that. Some of you were, weren't there, but... No mind has... No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Right? Okay. Because God has prepared the kingdom for those that love Him. Because what He's seeking is lovers in heaven. He doesn't want people that are selfish in heaven, like the devil who said, I will be as God. Look at me, 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 me. You see, the opposite of love is me, me, me. Love is you, 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 you. is looking after you. And in heaven, that's what it's going to be. There's no. And the devil and Jesus doesn't want that to happen in heaven anymore. He doesn't want. So he wants people to love him in heaven. That's why. The thing he, he's prepared all the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You, if you you weren't there, you might want to get the tape. But now let's go to verse 28 anyway. This is what we want to talk about right now. And, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose, for those He foreknew, He also predestined. Wow. He foreknows those who will love Him. That's why all things work together for the good of those that love God, because He foreknows those that will love Him. Never saw it that way, did you? That's what it says. Don't blame me. It's written here. Blame the Holy Spirit. He wrote it. And we know that all things work together for, those, for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. So the ones who are called were foreknown before. He foreknew. Hmm. He foreknew their decision. He foreknew that they would love him. <laughs> he 
He foreknew that they would want him. They would desire him. He foreknew. And so he works all things out for their good. Everything is worked out for them. It's not his fault. He's prophetic, you see. <laughs> he just happens to know all things. And so he knows the decisions people will make. And he, he knows, you know, there's the, when, when there's a... When, when there's a a famine that goes through the land. He foreknows each situation. Everything works out for the good of every person that he foreknows. <laughs> you know, on September 11th, it took that precise event to get people saved. Even as the tower was going down, people were getting saved. There's a testimony in 100 Huntley Street of a man who was in the towers when they fell and he started preaching the gospel as the towers were falling and he cried out, those of you who, are for me, who have heard this message and want Jesus, just say, I'm for Jesus. And, they were, and, and voices all through that place went, I'm for Jesus, I'm for Jesus, I'm for Jesus, I'm for Jesus, I'm for Jesus. And he said, follow me, those of you who are for Jesus. And he walked out of the building, but he's the only one that got out. He got out to tell the story, but a whole bunch of them are right now in heaven right now. And that was one floor. We don't know what was going on on all the other floors. But it took that precise event to get them to heaven, because all things work out for the good of those that love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He predestined. Wow. He foreknew that they would love Him if they were given the right opportunity. And so God worked an opportunity in their lives. The guy who was dying on the cross beside Jesus, do you think that that was just a, you know, chance? No, it was foreplanned. He planned, God planned that moment for that man since the beginning of time, it was planned that that man would die on the cross beside Jesus because that was the only thing that would bring him to Christ. Think about that. <laughs> Whew. If there's any faint chance somebody will get to Christ, he's going to make it happen. You follow me? He's going to do everything he can. And that's for everybody. Now that just explains a little bit. I'm not gonna, I can't go too long, but I want you to understand that how did I get that understanding? By His peace. Because all the other conclusions I came up with, there was no peace. <laughs> but there's peace on this one, isn't there? And if I could explain it even better, and if I was gone and I could tell you exactly what was happening and everything, you'd have a lot more peace. But I don't understand everything, you see. I'm limited in my understanding even of Scripture. We're limited. And that's why when you lose your peace, you go, Okay, I don't understand right now. Put it on the shelf. He'll explain it to me. But one thing remains true. God is always love anyway. That's a given. If you never lose that as you read Scripture, you'll never lose your peace. Otherwise, your image of God changes and you don't see His love anymore. And then you start working out of the wrong motives and you start working to please Him. And you get into the slave mentality and you do works and then you get tired. And then your Christian life becomes a bore. You don't have a smile on your face anymore. And instead of serving Jesus, you're now serving a master who's accusing you all the time. I wonder who you're serving. Hello? And then what's interesting is then we become, then we accuse others when we get into that mode. Whew. But you know what? What healed me of schizophrenia was that I found the truth, and what's kept me is that I've remained in the truth. I don't let anything come against my knowledge of God. The Bible says... <laughs> The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pulling down the strongholds, imaginations and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. 
Your knowledge of God, how you see God is so important because that determines if you're free or not. Do you follow me? So when you read the word, you don't understand, let the peace rule because the peace is superior to your understanding. If you lose your peace, the, the referee is blowing his whistle. He's saying you're out of bounds, out of bounds, out of bounds. That's not what I am. You got it wrong because your mind is limited. That's all. And if you think your mind is not limited and you can understand it, well, it's just a little issue of pride. Sorry. <laughs> Don't want to accuse you or anything. <laughs> so I have used this in many areas of my life. I've used this to make decisions. Now when I make my decisions in Jesus, um, I don't just go into the bedroom and then pray and then, then I get a piece about something and then go out and do it. It doesn't say he will guide your feet in the bedroom of peace. He says, it will guide your feet on the path of peace. That means as you're going, you have to be in movement. Do you follow me? You have to be in some form of movement. And then as you're in movement, you're going to collect information from different sources. Like my wife. <laughs> and my pastor. And mature friends that have made good decisions in their lives and they're walking well in the Lord in peace and, and, and as I and then you know there was a, there was a girl who, who, who felt that she, she in her bedroom she, she had this call to go to Africa okay do you understand that when, when God is putting his peace on you and, 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 and trying to direct you you have passions of your own and desires, and ideas of your own. And he's trying to communicate that. That's why he has to play that go the game of cold, cold, hot, hot with you. And because it weeds out, it weeds out the flesh. Because there is flesh, by the way. Okay? I just thought you should know. <laughs> You're not all holy. And, you've, you know, and in your bedroom, you, don't, you know, uh, it's not holy Bob that God is dealing with. You follow me? And so when the Holy Spirit comes in my bedroom and, and I got this, you know, this direction. And this girl had this. She had this, this sense that she was to go to Africa. And she, because, I, you know, and, and oh, I'm going to go to Africa. And, and, and she had visions of little children with, with, with black curly hair and... And I want you to understand something. She has a natural passion for African people and, and children. And she, had a, she just has a natural compassion. And often God uses that. But, and she knew she was to be a missionary because that had been confirmed and confirmed and God had put that on her heart. And now here she was in her bedroom thinking about Africa. And she got this strong peace and, she, and, and her emotions boiled over. And, and as she went out and she talked to people and she went on, you know, and she tried to go to Africa. She, she never got her peace. She couldn't get it. She applied to different organizations, never did it. And then she called this organization that went to Japan. And she said, you know, she said, I, I really have a sense for mission. And when she talked with them, the peace was there. She talked to her pastor. Peace was there. Her parents and everybody came. It was, the multitude of counselors had peace. You know, it was just, you know, it was just well done. And she went to Japan and everything went well for her. But on the way, you know, before she went, she got this question. She said, Lord, but they have straight black hair. And I saw curly black hair. Do you follow me? That's, uh, but the, the Lord guided her on the path of peace. What had happened was the Lord wanted her to go on missions. 
So in a bedroom, the Lord was warming her heart up for missions. But as she walked out of, the, of her bedroom and started walking on the path of peace, it funneled down. It got close. She got closer and closer and closer to where the Lord had her. And she's absolutely happy where she is right now, doing what God wants her to do. You follow me? Wow. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? So don't let your, in the, what you have in your bedroom be your last decision. Don't make your last decision right there. Give yourself some room to maneuver. That's where people have made mistakes. Okay, good. <laughs> in your emotions, if you're thinking things that are wrong, you're not going to have peace. The Bible says whatsoever things are pure, lovely, of good report, honorable, true. If you're thinking that God doesn't love you, that's not true. You're out of bounds. The referee is blowing his whistle. You start to get trouble if you go down that route. Even if you've sinned, God still loves you. That's the truth. When you hold on to that, his peace will be there. <laughs> right? Hmm. If you believe that you've done the unpardonable sin, you'll have lots of trouble. I know a lot of people that have been through that. I went through that when I was younger. I had no peace. And then as soon as I, I turned away from that, I said, no, no, no. God loves me. He forget I got my peace back. It was a lie. <laughs> if you believe a lie, you're going to not have any peace. Even if you, you know, if you believe things like, uh, I can't do anything with my life. I'm not worth anything. Well, I'll tell you something. When I first walked into a church, I wasn't good for much. But I believe that I could do all things through Christ that strengthened me. And that's the truth. When I believe that, I have peace. When I started getting down on myself and believing that, you know, that I, there's nothing much that I could do. I don't have much to offer. I'm just an ex-schizophrenic, no education. I would lose my peace. Right? Because the referee is blowing. No, no, that's not true. You're a new creation in Christ. End of story. <laughs> This is how he keeps your hearts and minds in Christ. Wow. Now, if you learn how to do this and apply this in your life, then at one point in every area of your life, you are now walking in peace in your emotions, in your mind, in your walk, in the things that you do, in the decisions that you make. When your Bible reading, in your prayer, in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And as you apply this into areas of your life, you'll see you'll begin walking on the path of peace and you will abide in His presence all day long. Whew. that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It's that simple. Devil does come and accuse me. I don't listen to him. He's the first one, like I said yesterday. When you have sinned, he's the first one to come. The accuser comes before the conviction. I normally wait. I turn my back to the accuser and wait for the Holy Spirit. He will come and, he will come and convict. Don't worry. <laughs> don't have to jump on the first one, you know. <laughs> don't worry. The Holy Spirit will come and convict. You don't have to go with the accuser. And I've learned by doing this, I stay in peace, even when I fail. Even when I make mistakes, I stay in His peace. And sometimes the Holy Spirit says to me, you know, I say, I say to, oh, well, I still got this thing that I'm dealing with. He said, well, that's just too bad. It's my grace. That's where you're at right now. You have to accept it. If you don't accept it and you turn to the accuser and try to repent, then you lose your peace. You know, there's a place where you are what you are by the grace of God. 
There's a place, you know, God wants to bring you further, but He's going to do the changing, and He's going to work in the areas of your life that He wants to work in. You can't change an area that He doesn't want to change right now. God's got a plan for your whole life. He's saying, this, this, this week we're going to work on the drugs, next week we're going to work on the alcohol, and some got all of that in one shot as they came to Jesus, but then He works on areas of your character, areas of your, areas of your life, and then He continues building on that. And if you decide, well, I want to have a nice smile all the rest of my days from now on, and he figures that's not the time for that because there's other issues to work on, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Do you follow me? Are you with me? Good. And if you walk in that, you know, and if, if you learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit, you will hear Him say that to you. Because people have been listening to the accuser of the brethren and never hear that because He never says that to people. There is no grace. He doesn't accept any error that you have. He doesn't give you any room to move or to grow. You've got to be perfect now. And then you see all your imperfections. Jesus is not, He's not concerned. He's not worried. He's got a plan for you. He knows where you're at. He has compassion. He knows the frailty of your state. He, he, and, when you, and I've learned to listen to him. So I keep my peace. And very often he says to me, it's okay, Bob. This part of your life right now, you have to accept and until you do, generally you don't change. Some people come up to me and they say, Bob, you got set free from medication right away. Yes, I said I did. And they said, but I'm still dealing with medication. I, I want to stop. I said, don't you stop. But I, and the doctor's telling you not to stop. And people go and stop the medication, hurt themselves, and get into another crisis. And I said, no, it's not, it's not yet. God will get, he'll deal with it at some time. But right now, you need to continue taking your medication. No, but I can't accept this in my life. It's a terrible thing. Yeah, that's because you're listening to the accuser of the brethren. If you learned how to listen to the Holy Spirit, he would probably have told you, don't worry, I will deal with this right now. You're worrying You know, <sighs> mm. oh Jesus, yes of course he wants to heal you, yes he wants, but there's a time, and then you get hard on yourself and you get accused and you, I'm still on medication, I'm still on medication, it's terrible and uh, I must not really a real Christian. The devil comes up and says, if you were a real Christian, you shouldn't be on medication. Right? And he accuses you and then you feel bad and you're just in, you're right here, just listening to him, feeling terrible. And the Holy Spirit is, I know the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to a lot of people saying, just right now I'm working in other areas. And once I finish those areas, the medication will go off by itself. But if you keep listening to the accuser, you can't let me work in the areas that I want to work in. So you don't change. So you'll stay on medication for all your life. Because he's got areas to heal in the heart before the medication can drop. It's not the medication that you're dealing with. The problem is not the medication. The problem is things here. And the Holy Spirit needs to deal with those. But if you're listening to the accuser and dealing with him, the Holy Spirit has got his hands tied. Wow. Wow. The Lord has changed me and I've been growing from glory to glory to glory. And that's what he wants. But you can't do that with the devil. There's no way you will grow. No way you will change. But with Jesus, there's a plan. But it takes grace. grace that's what the grace is. The things you want to do, you don't do. The things you don't want to do, you do. And regardless of that, you're still his. And he's still doing a work in you. And when you come to that place... You just get a peace and you just, this is where I am right now. And God's going to change me. And you know, as soon as you accept that, you, <laughs> there was a couple that came up to see me 
and they 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 wanted they wanted children. You know, some people get accused because they can't get children. All kinds of verses are used against them. Do you know that? And then, and then they put pressure on each other. The couple was pushing pressure on each other, and they they wanted children. Want children? They came up to me. We've come up to. We want prayer because we want children. I say. What is your life like? Well, we've been running around from doctor to doctor to psychiatrist to all kinds of people, getting all kinds of medications, all kinds of treatment. I said, that's what your life is like? What a life. All you're doing is living to get these children. You're worried. It's, the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. Kashta cares on him, for he cares for you. But you're caring for yourself, and you're putting pressure on each other all day long. Have you ever seen... That's what happens to couples that want children. And then, the, and, and then it's, oh, it's because he can't have, you know, he doesn't, he's important. Oh, oh then they find out it's her. And then, and then, oh, we're praying for her. And, and we'll pray for him later. And, <laughs> and then we go to see this doctor. And, that, and then the, the, the whole life is around this worry and this accusation that's in their life. And you know what I said to this, to this lady, this lady and this couple? I said, you know what? You just got to let go. You don't have children right now, and that's it. Just accept it. What? That's not right. You're spending so much time worrying about it that you're actually caring it for it yourself, and you're trying to resolve it in your own strength. The Bible says, Kashya cares upon him, and he will care for you. And you're, you're trying to care for yourself. And so you know what they did? Uh, they released each other. We prayed. They released each other from the... This testimony is on my website, by the way. Do you know what they're expecting? Triplets. <laughs> Do you know why, with all that stress, the poor little things couldn't get through? Take, you know, stress is a great part of your problems. Most sicknesses and illnesses are stress-related. That's why the Bible says don't worry about anything. Let the peace of God, you know, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ. And the main thing that the peace of God is saying is saying, don't worry, leave this in my hands, I will look after it. Don't try to figure it all out. Don't try to figure your life out. Don't try to figure everything in the Word out. Don't try to figure... Just the less you figure out, the better it is. I figure that there's nothing much to figure. <laughs> Do you like this theology? It's very simple. And you know what? Since I'm doing that, the kingdom is looking after me because I'm not looking after myself. That's what pagans do. Hello, the heathen are trying to worry about. They're always worried about me, 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 me. Right? That's what the devil wants you to do. He'll accuse you so you get jammed up there trying to figure it out, trying to work it out, trying to resolve your issues, trying to work your finances out. Oh. You want to try to get all your ducks in a row. And there's always one that steps out of line and one that quacks out of line. Right? You have to shoot a few. I've learned how to live with all my ducks out of the... Not, none of them in a row anymore. They're all just... Working around aimlessly. Go ahead. <laughs> my finances, my kids, my wife. I don't have to change nothing. Don't change. Just leave them all alone. <laughs> it's true. Give them to God. Pray for them. End of the story. My work, my finances, my everything. Your Christianity, your medication. Just, it's your problem because I'm your problem. 
Give your life to Jesus. That's what it means. Give your life. Just give Him it all. Give Him it all. That's a, I'm your problem, Jesus. I want it. Just you give it. You do it. And, I, and I'm, I'll seek your kingdom. And you look after me. And you know what? He will. He will. He will. As soon as you take your eyes off of the problem, the things will look after themselves. That's what the Bible says. Don't blame me. We go to all these conferences, don't we? How to get success. How to resolve your problems. How to manage your finances. You know what? I don't want to learn how to do nothing. God will give me wisdom. Yeah, ask His way. If He gives you wisdom, you do it. If He shows you, yeah, you need to go to this conference, do it. Follow me? Just... He'll give you wisdom. You follow His peace. He will give you insight. He will direct you. He will show you what to do. He'll show you what doctor to go see. You know what I mean? There's a place for that. But don't do it in your own strength. Don't try to resolve it. Whoa, boy. And then you'll stay right in the peace and all of that. Let everybody else get nervous. <laughs> You're dying. I don't care. says not to care about anything. <laughs> You're dying? Good. Sooner or better I'm going to have him. That's the worst thing that happen. That's my philosophy. That was Paul's philosophy too. I've had a Hell's Angel that's picked me up. I've had a Mafia member that's wanted to kill me. I've, I've been, people have tried to kill me very often. You know what? I want you to understand something. Unless God wants you to go, you can't go. <laughs> Even if you try, you won't. I'm telling you. You just... I, you know, I've been often to that place where it would be better to go than to stay, right? And so the Mafia guy wants to kill me. I said, go ahead. And he'll try. He can't do it. I said, why can't you do it? He said, I don't know. I can't do it. I said, do it. <laughs> he says, I can't. I'm trying. I said, why can't you do it? He says, it's no use. You don't have any fear. There's no thrill if there's no fear. Did you know that? When I do ministry in penitentiaries and stuff like that, they don't kill you if, they, if you don't have fear. The thing is, is fear is the trigger. At least they've got to have some fun out of it. But if they don't see the fear, there's no fun. Now, if they're killing each other, then they don't wait for the fear because then there's business to do. But for a, for, for a minister, there's no reason to kill them apart from if they can get some fun out of it. Right? <laughs> I've tried to go very often, but not, not by myself. But I mean, I've tr I, I'm telling you, You look after the kingdom, the kingdom looks after you. It's just a principle. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Yes, but Brother Bob, you don't know? Yeah, I know. I've been there. I've had worst. You don't want to hear all my stories, you'll get depressed. <laughs> I didn't come here to depress you. I just don't look at my life. You know, and what happens is God is taking it and He's changing it and molding it. Oh boy, He's doing a beautiful work if I let Him. I just let Him do it. You know, all things work together for the good of those that love God. All things. He will, yes, and even the pains and the troubles, He will work it all out together and He'll change you and mold you. He will feed you in the desert. He will look after you. Boy, Jesus. And you just, all you have to do is stay in His peace. Don't... You don't have to strive or worry. I know that that, that sounds easier said than done. But I want you to know it's possible. Amen. It is possible. <sighs> Holy Spirit flow. He's just saying, yes it is, you see. 
Give them some more, Lord, flow. More peace. Thicken your presence. Glory, flow. <laughs> you can't add a hair to your head. I know about that. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. You can jump up and down. They won't grow any better. Try electrocuting yourself. They'll just stand up. You can fluff them up with some hair growing shampoo, you know, shampoo. You can get an operation. Okay. Spend lots of money on it. I mean, or you can learn to accept the few that you have. <laughs> Comb them. I suppose if the Lord gives you a whole bunch of money and you want to put it in there, that's all, you know. I don't want to feel, I don't want to say what people should or shouldn't do, but you know what I mean? I mean, if you don't have it, just don't worry about it. Play with a few you got. You can, you know, you can place two hairs better than five or ten. <laughs> And you know what? The less stress you put on them, you might keep them. <laughs> I used to worry about not having an education. But the Lord said to me, don't worry, I can use you. But how can you use me if I'm not at you? He said, I will teach you. Relax. And today I'm teaching pastors and doctors and theologians. And, and I go in, in front of doctors and talk to them about depression. I have doctors in my conferences and nurses. And wow. Amazing. But if you worry, you can't be guided on the path of peace. You've got to let the Holy Spirit guide you on His path. And He's got a road for you. You know, you are what you are by the grace of God. He'll take your few hairs and your little education and whatever you are. And He's got a plan for you. <laughs> get up in the morning, comb them as best as you can and get on with it. <laughs> oh Jesus Father Flo <laughs> Oh there's just a beautiful sense of his peace and his joy right right here right here. Oh yeah don't think about it too much You notice one thing that people do I notice this the peace of God comes and they go Is this really you? <laughs> you notice when you do that, the piece just lifts? Because the referee is saying, no, that was me. Some people live a lifestyle like that. As soon as they, the piece comes, they go. So they just barely touch it. Every, the Holy Spirit is just coming and then, 
Oh, flow. <laughs> yeah, just flow right through. Let the wind of your peace come. Flow right through. Yeah, flow. Another way, flow. I'm very sensitive to the peace. That's what healed me. So I've learned how to follow it. I follow his peace in the meetings. That's all I'm doing is I'm following the path of peace. On the, here he comes. Right there. A whole bunch of you right in this section just got that. Who did? Just raise your hands. Just raise your hands high. There's more than, there's more than that. You need to follow this. If, if his peace came over, you need to follow it. Otherwise, the peace will subside. If you don't lift your hand now, it'll be a teaching lesson. We're already going into the practice of it. I've seen the Holy Spirit lift off of a whole meeting and it gets so dry because they wouldn't follow the peace. Look how it's lifting right now. Oh boy. Okay, who felt that? Raise your hands. It's not me, it was the Holy Spirit. There were more than that. That was you. That was you. You didn't raise your hand. That is, you're not dealing with, you're not dealing with me. You de I can see the cloud. You're dealing with the Holy Spirit. I'm teaching you a principle. Let's practice it right now. Because look at the level. If you don't lift your hands, those that felt that, that it was His peace, everybody will be affected. You affect everybody around you. Because the anointing is go will go down. This is teaching here. This, you want the ap application in your lives. This is what I do. If, if I was sitting there and I felt that, I would go right away because that's how I've learned to follow the peace of God. Interesting. So again, I'm going to ask that question. How many of you felt that right through when I did that? Oh, look at the difference now. I knew it was that. I knew all along. I'd seen it. I saw <laughs> now the peace is coming back up. I mean, look at this. Look at that right now, right through the room. Flow. Because you are going there. See that? Look at that now. There's a lesson in this I'm teaching you. Fire. <sighs> Flow. Right through the room, Lord. Let your peace grow right through this whole place right now. Let it grow. Let it get thicker. Let your glory come in. Flow. See, all he wants, you're not doing my altar call. When I do an altar call, it's not me. No one thing. I just say, here, the peace came. Those who got it, come. It's the Holy Spirit's presence who's doing the altar call. That's how I do my altar calls. It's the Holy Spirit who just went and came out. If, he, if I'm doing the altar call and said, those that felt that just come, it's basically, he's saying, hotter, hotter, let's go. And then you notice those that come, it gets really hot. And they start laughing and get the joy. Right? <laughs> but... All I'm doing in my meetings is doing what I do in my life. I follow him and, I've, and then I know when to, to do, give prophetic word and then, I, then I'm learning how to, when to do healing ministry and just, and I've been following him ever since the very beginning and that's how I've learned how to, to follow the Holy Spirit. This is why I see the glory of God come down on crowds in the streets and, and whole crowds give their lives to Jesus on the streets and, and power come over whole motorcycle gangs that have given their lives to the streets and, and start dancing in the spirit in the streets. The whole motorcycle gang gave their life to Jesus and dance in the spirit. Jewish dancers singing in tongues. They weren't Christians before. The whole gang. All of these things I've seen because I've followed his peace. If you start following, I tell you, there's beautiful things. Flow. Flow, 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 thicken your peace, flow, right through. There, there we go, another way, flow. When I go, and the reason there's a reaction is because I know, because I'm, I'm very sensitive to his peace and his presence. Flow. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, flow. Bless them. 
How many of you have been getting some of those waves at some point? Just raise your hands wherever. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Flow. Now, we're going to have to do this carefully. Those of you that felt a wind as I did it, just raise your hands. Just a, like a wind, a precise wind. Those of you who felt waves of peace, raise your hands. Okay, more. Those of you who felt the wind, raise your hands again like, a, like, like a, a real wind just come right over you. I'd like you to come first, if that's okay.